good morning. Welcome to each and every one of you. So glad that you're in the house of the Lord with us and a beautiful day uh, to worship the Lord. And uh, good to see smiling faces this morning. And so many of you have come up to me and given me such a warm, loving greeting. And just good to be in the house of the Lord uh, with God's people. And I'm excited about what God wants to do in our hearts this week. I hope you've been praying and I hope you're expecting for God to do something great in our heart. I know I want them to work in my heart, and I want them to work in the hearts of this uh, uh, church family, individual families, uh, for God certainly has something great in store. Uh, our scripture reading, uh, the opening verses for this morning, come from Psalm 85, and the Bible says this, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. You know, as we turn our eyes and our attention and our hearts to the Lord this week, I trust that we won't be guilty of turning back to the folly and to the things that the devil's using in our life, but we'll put all of our attention on him and allow him to do the work in our life that he wants to do. Would you stand together with me, please? And just as those verses use the phrase, revive us again, that's the song. We're going to start off singing this morning, hymn 380. If you want to use your hymnal, revive us again. We'll sing the first, second, last. As we lift our voices to worship him, make it a prayer in your heart this morning and ask God to do just that in our lives. Revive us again. us again and uh, let's go to him as individuals right now but also as a church family and uh, ask him uh, to do just that in our hearts to revive our hearts and uh, to turn our minds and our lives uh, back to him brother jimmy if i catch you before you sit down would you lead us in this opening prayer and uh, just ask the lord to speak to us please First, I just do want to say, oh, that is hot right there. All right, back that off a little bit. 
But first, I just want to say that thank you all once again so much for all your prayers for me and uh, Miss Hannah and Little Allie as we are still getting things adjusted right now back home. But she is doing well. We do appreciate your continued prayers and your support. Uh, we, do, uh, we are praying to get her here to church as soon as possible because we want her to meet her loving church family and to be able to meet everybody. But uh, we are, she is doing well. We have a couple more doctor's appointments coming up for follow-up. So but thank you all so much again for all your prayers that you've had for us during this time. And I do thank Pastor again for taking over the announcements for me for the last couple of uh, – last few weeks uh, but I'm ready to get back on into it and I do appreciate all the help for that and the first thing of course we want to remember is that today of course kicks off our spring revival for 2024 very excited to hear what brother Phil has to share with us this morning from the, from uh, from the word and then we're very excited to hear brother Hemet Patel with us uh, for the rest of the week starting tonight at 6, and then Monday uh, all the way through Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And Brother Hemet, always a wonderful, wonderful preacher. You're going oh, to enjoy what he has to say, and we always appreciate uh, everything that he did in the mission field for all those years over in India. So be praying for him as he is uh, going to be joining us here tonight and for the rest of this week as well. And then pa teen parents, really quickly, uh, we didn't say anything about this uh, quite yet because we didn't know if we were going to be able to follow through on it yet, but we are hoping to take our teenagers out this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock to a place called Stars and strikes which is a great bowling place out in raleigh uh we're looking to leave the church around five if that does not work for you uh please contact me we know it's a little bit short notice and we will get that uh we'll get that figured out for this coming saturday at five all right and then after that we have palm sunday very uh on next sunday and as always with our palm sunday we will be having uh for of course the lord's supper and feet washing in the evening worship service for next sunday so be uh, be uh mindful of that as we come into next uh, next Sunday, as we try to remember the triumphant entry of our Lord into the city of Jerusalem, riding to his own sacrifice and willingly knowing what he was going in for for that, for that as well. Be in prayer also for our Easter egg hunt. We're still trying to get some things worked out for this location. It's being proven to be a bit more difficult than we originally thought it was, but we're going to get this figured out. And we did want to say we are going to be having an egg stuffing party after the evening service tonight. So if you can stick around for a little bit after the evening service for tonight, we will get some of those Easter eggs filled on up. Thank you for those who have already brought candy and things to stuff the eggs with, but we need plenty more. So please keep that on coming. We need plenty more to come as we have got lots and lots of eggs to stuff for our kids this coming up year. But we are still looking to have this this egg hunt on the 30th for this for this month then after that on the 31st we will be celebrating our resurrection Sunday here at church and as always we will be having our sunrise service out here and that is going to be out uh, in the parking lot at 8 30 for that coming Saturday and we will have breakfast for everybody afterwards as well so try to remember that and we'll keep you updated as it, it continues to get get closer but that sunrise service will be at 8 30 out here on uh, the 31st for this month and then our resurrection service to follow as we remember the day that sin was finally defeated and death was finally done. So we do great, are thankful for that wonderful remembrance that we have uh, for our Lord and Savior coming and giving that great sacrifice for us. That is what we have right now in the way of announcements. I'm going to invite uh, Brother James Ford now as he has our scripture reading for this, for this week. Once again, thank you all so much for your continued prayers and your support for me and Hannah. Little Allie, we have felt the prayers and God is already working and we are seeing miracles done with our little girl uh, every single day and she is doing very, very well right now. So but thank you all so much uh, for all of that. Brother James, please come and share what the Lord has had a place on your heart this morning. Yes, sir. If you'd like to turn, I'll be in Micah chapter 6. I'm going to read the first eight verses. As Micah kind of intercedes between the people and God and God trying to tell them in Micah chapter 6 it says hear ye now what the Lord saith arise contend thou before the mountains and let the hills hear thy voice hear ye O mountains the Lord's controversy and ye strong foundations of the earth for the Lord hath a controversy with his people and he will plead with Israel, O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed thee out of the house of servants. I sent thee before thee, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O oh, my people. Remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Siddim. And to Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? 
Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O oh man, what is good, and what the Lord doth require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God.
Yes, let's all stand together. I'm looking forward to that day when he comes again. What a glorious day it'll be for all the believers, the church, those born again, Christians, Christ followers. We'll go to be with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Let's sing this song as we prepare our hearts for the message, not only this morning, but throughout the course of the week and what God wants to do in our heart. My prayer is that I believe one of the hindrances of the church having revival is that we let self get in the way of the Savior. I know verbally we don't acknowledge that, we don't admit that, but so often I believe revival tarries because self is in the way. And so as we sing through this, I'm reminded that it's nothing of our own that we could accomplish but it's only what he accomplishes through us. May our prayer be that self will be removed and the Savior will have uh, free reign to do in our hearts and our lives what he desires to do. Let's sing all these verses together this morning. We'll do the repeats at the end.
seated. Hallelujah, what a wonderful truth and the great singing this morning. Well, let's worship him now in our giving. What a joy it is to give back to the Lord and to be faithful to him. And so I trust and pray that you will join us as we worship him. And we'll start with sections one and three. And you come and then two and four follow. And uh, let's give back to the Lord as he has so abundantly blessed each and every one of us. Uh, Brother Wayne, would you lead us in this prayer? Amen. Thank the Lord for that truth, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, Brother Caleb has prepared for our junior church and children's church to uh, meet this morning, and um, so are y'all teachers today as well, so we'll hang, uh, we'll keep them back uh, just for uh, a little bit and uh, through the special music, and then after our special music, we're thankful to have the ladies trio sing, and uh, after our special music, of course, no stranger uh, he's never been a stranger here, but definitely not now in the last few years, and uh, many of you are blessed each Sunday morning in the Sunday school class as he, um, I would call it teaching a lesson, but I walk by too often to just call it teaching a lesson, so, and uh, he teaches thoroughly and uh, preaches the truth of God's word, uh, but thankful for our speaker this morning, and uh, obviously I'm thankful in multiple facets of his influence and uh, in my life, and how he's challenged us and raised us, but also has been an example for us uh, in the ministry. And has always loved the Lord and loved the church and loved the word, uh, but he never sacrificed his family to do that. And so we thank you for that. But he's still faithfully preaching uh, the truths of God's word, and they're unchanging. And I believe when the truths we preach are unchanging, we as God's men and mouthpiece ought to be unchanging. And uh, so he needs no introduction, but we're so thankful to have him kicking off our meeting. So after the ladies uh, sing, and uh, he's already ready to go, uh, Dad, you come and uh, preach to us this morning what God's laid on your heart. Ladies, you come, and I hope that this song will be a blessing to you.
Amen. He's alive. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Somebody said, how do you know? And I said, because he lives in my heart. And that's, that's great, isn't it, child of God? You know because he lives in your heart. All right, if there's any more boys and girls that need to go out for June church, I think they're being excused. And while they're going out, please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Thank you, son, for this opportunity uh, to preach this morning. God's Holy Spirit has been working in my own heart. I'm not preaching to you today on any merit of my own. I'm preaching today only because of what these ladies just sang about. The blood of Jesus that has washed my sins away. It's nothing I deserve, no merit of mine, but it's all because of grace. And I'm so thankful to have this opportunity to share with you the word of God. If you'll stand with me as we read the first nine verses of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among them the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But other fell into good ground. And some other, and other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold some 60-fold, some 30-fold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. How's your spiritual hearing this morning? Do you have your spiritual ears turned on? And I'm not talking about just these ears that vibrations inside of the miracle that God put on the side of our head, we can hear sounds that we can make distinctions out of. But I'm talking about, do you have the ears of your soul on this morning? Will you pray as I pray, Lord, speak to my heart. And I got one further challenge. If you'll ask him to do that, then will you say this, and if you'll speak to me, I will obey. Revival will never come till we get there. Prayer, seeking God, letting him speak, and then when he does speak, we must obey. Father, help me as I preach. I'm just your servant. I'm just the mouthpiece that somehow you have chosen for this hour. It is through no merit of my own, Lord. I confess to you, without you, I can do nothing and so I yield myself to you again and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and then as I desire to be a spirit filled preacher I pray that every Christian who's here this morning for we're talking about revival we've been talking about it now for weeks but today begins that series of meetings every believer needs to pray, Lord, help me to be a spirit-filled believer. So as the word goes out, as the seed is sown, it will fall upon good ground, on good soil. Please help me this morning, bind Satan, cover me with your blood, and speak to all of our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. 
This passage of scripture that we read is most commonly known as the parable of the sower. Although there are some commentators who call it the parable of four kinds of soil, which we're going to see both as we look at this text. But uh, uh, I, I want to start off jumping right into uh, the middle of the text, so to speak. After Jesus began, he, he spoke in parables. In fact, I believe that he uses uh, the word in either Mark or in Luke in many parables. Now, let's raise a question that's okay for us to ask, okay? Why did Jesus speak in parables? And if you're wondering if it's okay for you to ask it, just go down to verse number 10 in Matthew chapter 13. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, let's pause there for a minute. We're asking the same question the disciples asked, right? Why did you speak in parables to them? Who's the them? Well, you go back to the beginning of the chapter and you find out Jesus has come out of a house. He's been ministering in that area. In fact, Luke says every people from every city were come to see and to hear the Lord Jesus. And he, and he comes out and he sits down by the seaside. He sits down by the seashore, okay? And, and uh, as he begins to minister, the crowds have gathered, and so he, he contemplates, I really need to get uh, a better position so this great multitude that is gathered will be able to hear me. And uh, I'm sure that Jesus had his own uh, inner uh, megaphone system, PA system, uh, but uh, he, just, he called one of the fishermen and said, may I use your boat? And he gets in the ship and, and they push out from shore and he sits down in the boat and then he begins to speak to the multitudes that have gathered there, as Luke says, from every uh, city. Now, uh, he speaks in parables. Matthew 13 is a whole chapter of parables. It is powerful truth. Now, listen. A parable is a short story with familiar, things that are familiar to us to teach us truths about things that are not familiar to us. The simple definition is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and I'm sure most of you know that. But it is where Jesus takes a familiar truth uh, to teach those who want to hear. Now, you're going to understand in this passage. And folks, I, I'm just preaching the word of God. I, I, I listen, <laughs> in this passage is going to describe everybody that's here. Everybody in the service is in this passage somewhere. Now I tell you, I don't know about you, but I, 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 want, I want to be one of those, I, I want to be one of those who got your, your hand cupped behind your ears and, and listening to every word that falls from the lips of the Savior as he speaks this parable. And you know what? Uh, he spoke in parables so that those who were hungry for truth would understand and receive the teaching uh, that Jesus was teaching. But I'll tell you what, there's a double-edged sword here. He also spoke in parables to folks who didn't want to hear. Now, you ever had a child, you know, maybe being a little stubborn, and you're trying to talk to them, and they go, they close their eyes, they cover their ears, they don't want to hear a thing you have to say. Jesus talking to some folks like that. They don't want to hear a thing he has to say. They don't want to see what he's doing. They don't want to understand his truth. So he says, okay, I'm going to give it to you in parables. So even if you open your eyes and see and you open your ears and hear, you're still not going to understand. Now that goes back to a prophecy, back to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 where God revealed himself to the prophet Isaiah and he said to him, I'm going to send you to a people that will not hear, that will not see, that will not understand. What kind of a ministry is that? For God to send you... He tells you before you go, Brother Caleb, they're not going to listen to you. They don't want to hear a thing you've got to say. They will not understand what you say anyway. He said, I'm sending you a people that has heavy ears. The other word there is dull. And they have hard, listen, the word that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 9, uh, 6, 9 is 
gross. Their hearts are gross. Would God say that about people? He did. Do you and I understand this morning that God not only knows everything about us, he looks inside of us and he sees our heart today just like we are. He knows our thoughts. He knows our spirit. He knows our motives. He knows everything about us. And when he told them in Isaiah 6, 9, these people will not hear you because their hearts are gross. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You, you, be careful about calling somebody gross, amen? Now, how many of you understand there's some things that gross? I, I, I think of one thing, Brother Caleb, I hope you will never do. Uh, the, uh, another youth pastor did. I guess he was trying to impress the, his, his teen group. But uh, oh, good. I'm not even going to tell you what it is because it's so gross you won't even want to hear the rest of my message. But the word gross, you know what it means? <clears throat> Fat. Thick calloused. Anybody know anything about having a callus? You know, you, you start working out in the garden and, and, and you start doing it by hand and you start doing it with a hoe or with a rake and you start, and, and pretty soon you, you, the, skin, the skin here gets tender and you get some blisters up there, right? Anybody ever had that experience? But then after you keep going, it gets what? It gets tough. It gets calloused. And, and you can't you can't really do much to do. Listen, I don't know. I, I don't want to even tell you that. I, I have been my own personal physician in many matters in my life, including pulling my own teeth when it was necessary instead of going and paying the dentist $500. Why should I go pay him $500 to do it when I can do it myself? And if you don't believe I've done that, there's my wife. She's witness to it. We were on vacation one time, I think, down in Florida. And one of my back teeth was bothering me. I said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And I went in the bathroom. A few minutes later, it's laying on the bathroom counter. And, and I have paid a dentist anything. But uh, now listen to me. <clears throat> Callous, thick, hard. Some people get so hard. Listen to me. They are never moved by any truth they hear. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's sad. That's sad. And some people who take the attitude, there's nothing you can say, preacher. You're not going to change me. There's nothing you can say to move my heart. I'm, and heart is so hard that they will not hear. Well, there's only one alternative. Are you listening to me? There's only one alternative for folks like that. That's judgment and death and hell. What kind of heart do you have this morning? You don't have to bow your head and close your eyes, but you right now whisper from your soul, Lord, please speak to my heart. And if you speak to me today, I will ob obey. So a parable Jesus purposefully used to teach those who were hungry, Brother Linwood, for the truth. But he also purposefully used a parable to conceal the truth from those who didn't want to hear it. They're out there sitting there with their ears covered up and their eyes closed and their heart hard. Okay, I'll just give it to you in a story that you can't understand anyway. Wow. You know what this passage teaches me as Jesus stands here on the shore and then gets in the boat, and the multitudes are there, and he launches out into this parable of the sower. It teaches me, listen, people need the Lord. Now, let me start right here with us, okay? I, I'm glad, you know, as Pastor said, you, you, you know me, I know you, you know, and so you're not sitting back there in the pew this morning, man, I'm trying to figure this guy out. Sometimes when a new guest preacher comes in, we're not really ready to hear what he says until we check him out first, right? We've got to check him out. I mean, you already know me. No secrets. Here I am. Now listen. People need the Lord. May I give us a little clarification on that? The people of Wildwood Free Will Baptist Church need the Lord. Well, you say, preacher, surely you're, you're old enough and you're, you're mature, enough, mature enough in the Lord. You, you don't need the Lord. I think the older I get, and hopefully the more mature I get, the more I realize I need the Lord. 
I have told him this week, this morning, Lord, I can't go do this without you. And I've been doing this since I was 19 years old. But I told the Lord, I can't go up there and do this without you. I've got to have you because people need the Lord. So let's make it, you know, we, we've kind of narrowed it from the multitude to the Wildwood Church. Do you? Do you need the Lord? Do you want the Lord to come and do something in your hearts in these days? Listen, these days will be gone. These services will be gone so fast. We need to be ready and open and willing to hear and to receive and to obey what God says to us. Do you need the Lord? Last Sunday night, I believe we had the prayer time around the altar. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we're living in a, a wicked world. You understand that, don't you? If you understand that, say amen. And it's not getting any better. In fact, the Bible said, and we witness, it's getting worse and worse and worse. We're living in a wicked world. We're living in a wicked culture. And listen, that's not just far off somewhere else. That's right here around us. We made a quick trip to Tennessee and then to Brianna's wedding. I bring you greetings from Brianna Lathrop. She's not Brianna Lathrop anymore. She's Brianna Whitstein. Married a young man. She met at Southeastern, and we had the joy of going and having a little part in her wedding yesterday. But since we were going that far to Shelby, North Carolina, we decided uh, just two or three more hours to go on over the top of the mountain and go to Mamaw's house and and we had some things we need to check out and some things we need to take care of. And so we went there on Thursday, went to the wedding on Saturday, and came back here last night after the wedding. Now, we had to stop by Walmart to get some things. And uh, I hope there's no other women. That, uh, my, my wife needs to repent this morning for lying. She gets out of the car. I drop her off in front of Walmart. And she says, now, I know Lindsay never does you this way. She said, honey, I'll be back in about 10 minutes. <coughs> I learned a long time ago to multiply by three whatever she told me. So I said, okay, 30, 35 minutes from now, she'll come back out. 51 minutes later. And yes, I was counting. 51 minutes later, she comes back out. And she comes to the door and opens the door and she turns toward me and she says, is there a sign on my back? Is there a sign on my back? Maybe she thought somebody walked by her and slapped something, a piece of tape on her. I, she said, honey, I went in that store and I'm taking care of my shopping. And she's really trying to justify why she was in there so long. But she said, well, she said a lady came up to me and started talking to her about some kind of female surgery. And, of course, my wife used to work in that area. And, and, but she didn't know that. She didn't know my wife from Adam. She walked up, and she started talking. And then another woman, my wife, one of the things she was doing was picking up some flowers for us to put on her mom and daddy's grave, which we did. And, but what, what's the flowers are? Well, we're, we're going to change the the winter flowers out to summer flowers. And she told about her mom and dad both passing. And the woman just started crying. Just started bawling. Before they got through, she's hugging her neck and thanking her. You know, sometimes people are hurting so bad, all they're looking for is somebody to, just to listen. You know, you don't have to be a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist to, be a help to some people. Some people, all you need to do is listen. Here's why I use that illustration. There we were. They didn't know, those women didn't know her, know anything about her, but they were hurting. People need the Lord. Everywhere we go, people need the Lord. What is revival? Revival's been de defined in a lot of ways. Let me, let me give you some thoughts on that. Revival is repentance of God's people and returning to God. 
You, you go to those seven letters in, in Revelation, and, and three words with R that Jesus used as he gave it to John about those seven churches. Remember, repent, and return. Listen, revival will never come without God's people being honest with their soul and God about their sin. Repenting of their sin, or may I change it and say our sin, and then returning to do the first works. That's what revival is. It is God sending new life. You ever had a time in your life as a Christian? I'm talking to saved folks right now. You ever had a time in your life as a Christian where your Christianity is just kind of dull and lifeless? You know, well, I'm going to church because I know I'm supposed to, but, you know, pastor reminds us often, not, you don't come to church because you have to. You come to church because you get to. Amen. And, and the attitude you come to church with determines what you get out of it too. Now listen. You ever need a special touch from God in your eye? Oh, I'm so glad that God has promised his priest, his preachers, his people, a fresh anointing. A fresh anointing. Oh, to fall before the Lord and to pray and seek God's face. And God, I can't do this without you. Lord, I need a fresh anointing this morning. It can't be Phil Ainge. It's got to be the Holy Spirit of God that is preaching to the hearts of people. Hey, sometimes that starts with individual believers in the pew. I challenge the men Tuesday night, draw a circle around where you are and say, pray, oh God, send revival in this circle. That means start with me. Send it to me. I guarantee you, men, if you have revival in your heart, your wife's going to know it. Uh, she she going to know. I, and, and, and that can be vice versa. Listen, dear lady that played piano. She, <laughs> let me make this quick, okay? She played the piano, Brother Bobby, and she bounced with every, every, every chord she hit. I mean, it's a wonder that piano bench held, held up. But, but <clears throat> she was, um, I'm not going to say she was a women's liver, but she was pretty much the boss of her home. Nobody like here like that, right, ladies? Nobody like that here? She was the boss of her home. But she came and she listened to me preach for several months and something happened. Something happened. She knew she was saved, but she knew that her life was in disobedience to the word of God. And she had an unsaved husband that she couldn't reach Hey, listen, when I went to see him, he knew I was at the front door. He ran out the back door. I'm not kidding you. That's, that's a truth, and God knows it. Listen, many times we'd go and try to win him to the Lord, and, and nothing happened except he'd run further away. But God changed her life. God sent her revival inside her heart in the church on the piano bench, and Here's a man who's been running from me for years. He invites me and the evangelist we had in revival to come have lunch with him. I like to lost my false teeth and I don't even have any. Listen, I couldn't believe it. This same guy is inviting me and the evangelist to come have lunch with him. We were invited graciously and we went in and we fellowshiped a little while, sitting at the table to eat a lunch that he had prepared for us. His wife was at work. He said, now let me tell you why I asked you to come. I am not ready to give my heart to the Lord yet. You know, that pretty well slaps you in the face with hoping to talk to a fellow about the Lord. I just am not ready. He said, but I'll tell you what has happened. God has changed my life. She's not a different woman, and I know that God is real because of what I'm seeing in her life. Wow. And Brother Bobby, it wasn't too long after that when my dad was with us in revival. We went to see him, and we caught him in his shop in the afternoon, and there was only one door to the shop. And my dad got in, and I stood in the door. And that day, 
my dad had the privilege to lead him to Jesus. You know where it all started? In his wife's heart, who was already a believer, pianist in the church, when she had revival in her heart and allowed God to change her life, he saw it, and that was a louder sermon than any sermon I could ever preach to her. When we left South Carolina, honey, he was uh, Sunday school superintendent in Preble Baptist Church. He got saved, and as Brother James taught us this morning, he got saved. He hit the ground following Jesus right then. Amen? Listen, people need the Lord. What is revival? It's revival for his people, sometimes with individual believers, sometimes with churches, sometimes with mass movements, and I don't have time to go there this morning. But, oh, our history is replete with mass revivals that came through and swept the country, and thousands of people were born into the kingdom of God. We know that's happened. We know it's still possible. But let me bring us back to where we are right now. You cannot revive what has never had life. You see, revival is for those who've already been saved, been born again, received life from God, but their, their heart, their life has gotten kind of stale. And, oh, Lord, I need revival. And I, I hope that many of you have prayed as I have, Lord, I need revival. Please do a work in my heart. The parable of the sower, I haven't forgot our text. I haven't forgot where we are. The parable of the sower clearly identifies that not everyone who professes to be saved really is. A few of you heard that. Did all of you hear that? Not everyone who professes to be saved really is. Jesus uses four kinds of soil in this parable to represent four different types of hearers and their responses to the word of God. Again, it emphasizes people desperately need the Lord. Why was Jesus standing on that short or sitting on the short first and then sitting in that boat speaking to this molten, these multitudes that are got because he knew more than anybody else that they needed the Lord. Now again, go back to the question Peter asked. Lord, why are you speaking to them? You know, that's the way we are sometimes, isn't it? Somebody out here this morning may be sitting here, Brother Phil, that's a great message, but it ain't for me. And you got pitchfork religion. And you're throwing your pitchfork in every bale of hay that comes in your lap, and you're throwing it over your neighbor to the people behind you. You folks that sit on the back row, you get the whole load before the service is over, okay? Because f- folks who don't want it, they're throwing it backwards, okay? Now listen. Jesus uses these four soils. And then he says, look at verse 18. Would would you please look at verse 18? For time's sake, I'm not reading the whole passage, so I'm pointing you to pertinent verses. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Did Jesus just go and tell this story, just have a good time? He's already told us in verse 9, he that hath ears, and we're not talking about these ears that we hear audibly with on the side of our heads. We're talking about the ears of our soul. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. And so here he says, here's the parable of the soul. It's some passages God leaves us to try to figure out in the context and with the Holy Spirit's help to teach us. But this is one where he just explains it himself. Isn't that good? And so he says, when anyone heareth the king, the word of the kingdom, this verse 19, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. Now, I want you to show me how smart you folks are. Who's the wicked one? The devil. What's his name? Satan. All right? In these three gospels where Jesus gives the parable of the sower, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he calls him the wicked one here, he calls him Satan in Mark, and he calls him the devil in Luke. Now, he is definitely the wicked one. 
He is the evil one. Do you know this morning, folks, listen to me. Do you know this morning that the devil hates you and is out to destroy you? And listen, it's not just people of God that have a, ha, ha, have a target on their back. It's not just servants of the Lord that have a target on their back. If you're a child of God, uh, Satan hates you, and he's out to steal, to kill, and to destroy, John 10 and verse 10. Wow. And so Jesus gives this parable and he explains in Luke 8 verse 11 he says the seed is the word of God now let me take just a minute okay and I'll tell you right up front I've never done this this way myself when I sowed seed manually I did it with a little bag hanging over my shoulder that had a handle on it like this and I just went around the, the yard and the seed spraying out Any, anybody else ever use one of those things uh, you know, he did not have a, a multi-layered tractor out there uh, f where he was going through several roads at the time uh, planting. Well, he did it. Hey, this guy did it by hand. Probably had a sack hanging over his shoulder that was full of seed. Maybe with one hand, he, he tried, kind of held the opening open, and he'd reach in with the other hand. And as he walked in the field, he would just gather it and just sow it. He would try to get most of the seed uh, on good soil because what was his goal? It was to produce a harvest. And the more seed that's in good soil, uh, the bigger the harvest would be. But you think about it now. If you're sowing seed uh, and, and the wind comes along, what happens? Some of your seed just got blown away. And... Uh, Outside of the edges of these fields, in fact, I think while Jesus was telling this parable to the multitudes, I think probably out of his eye, he could see a farmer off in the distance doing exactly what he's describing because we've already said a parable is what? Taking things that are familiar and teaching something that is unfamiliar. So here, here he said, now, some of the seed falls by the wayside. This is the path around the field. Uh, where passerbys walk. They don't walk straight across. They have enough respect for the farmer and what he's trying to do, not to walk right through his field. And, and so uh, some of the seed falls on the wayside, which the Bible tells us is trodden down. Just simply, not from people doing wrong, just walking, just, you know, and the seed falls on that. Now, how much of that do you expect to take root? Very little, if any. But another problem on top of that he tells us in all three of these Gospels that the fowls came, F-O-W-L-S, the fowls came and devoured the seed that fell on the wayside. So all of it's being eaten up. There is no chance that anything is going to grow a value out of the wayside soil. Then he talks about the second soil. Stony soil is what it's called in two of the parables. And, and one of them it says, they sowed upon a rock. Now, how many of you ever worked on a farm, tried to raise a garden? How many? Come on. Does it make sense to you to plant on top of a rock? I pastored in Arkansas for a while, and, and some of the fields out there, before they planted, they'd have to bring in a a, a really a backhoe because they had to go through the field and they had to dig out huge stones that they put in the field because the crop's not going to grow when those stones are just under the surface of the ground. So the stony ground is full of, is full of, of rocks and uh, uh, the seed uh, sprung right up, Jesus said, but it didn't last when the hot sun came out. It was scorched because it had no deepness, no depth, no roots, and therefore it withered away. The third kind of soil, he calls it thorny. And the seeds planted comes up, but some other things come up. And again, how many of you from your planting experiences, you understand that thorns come up faster than what you planted, right? And then they do what? They spread, and they'll wrap themselves around 
your vegetation that you have planted, and they will what? Choke it out. Oh, I want to plead with you. If it do any good, I'd get on my knees and beg you this morning. Don't be a wayside here. You're hearing my words, but it's falling on hard soul, and the devil will come. The devil will come and snatch it away before you have time to receive it. Oh, please, please, don't be a stony ground, stony heart today where the seed falls and, boy, you come out and you pat me on the back and that's not what I'm preaching for. He's a preacher, that was great. That was good, man. I love that. And you go out and forget everything you heard. You're a forgetful hearer. Stony ground. It doesn't go anywhere because you have no depth to you. A number of our last Discipleship class members are sitting here this morning. Over and over again, folks, you have heard me tell you, you are not going to make it apart from the word of God. And you are not going to make it apart from being faithful to God's house to hear God's man preach his word. Listen, don't be stony ground. Don't be thorny ground. Do you have things in your life? Oh, by the way, this can happen to Christians. Do you have things in your life that are choking out the word that you hear week after week after week? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But then thank God for the good ground. Brought forth fruit, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Hopefully we'll have time to talk more about that as we go. And you see, listen to me. Let's go back and talk about these four soils a minute. The wayside here. He hears, but just doesn't understand. I, I, I believe that we preachers ought to make the gospel simple. We ought to take profound truth and make it simple and put it down here on the lower shelf where the smallest child can get it. By the way, aren't you glad the gospel is simple enough for a child to believe and be saved? Praise the Lord for that. But this wayside here, he's so hard-hearted, he, he, he just can't understand. The wicked one comes and snatches the, the word out of his heart. And, and he says, lest they should believe and be saved. Well, wait a minute, Jesus, isn't that what you want? Don't you want people to believe and be saved? But he's talking to those that are doing this. Closed their eyes, they've covered their ears, they've hardened their heart, they don't want to hear his truth. The stony ground. This here hears the word and receives it with joy and gladness. Joy and gladness. But again, because there's no depth, no root, it only lasts a short while. Tribulation, persecution, and temptation. Destroy the word. One of the things I'm trying to do is why are you pausing so much, Brother Phil? So I got over 50 years of experience of teaching and preaching people. And I could write a book filled with illustrations of every one of these types of soil. I'm telling you, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I'm just saying to you with all my heart, you better listen while you can. Not because I'm preaching, but because it's God's truth, you better listen while you can. Because what happens? We can all describe some folks that we have seen sitting in these services. They get offended, and the word Jesus used was, they fall away. I'm going to tell you, 
I'm not saying this because he's my son, but our pastor is a great preacher. And I'm telling you, thank God he preaches the truth, gun braille straight. Some people are not here today because he preaches it too straight. They've gotten offended and they've fallen away. You know, in Bible times, they didn't have a church on every other block. Man, I, I drove through that area going to that wedding yesterday up in Shelby, North Carolina. I've never seen so many. I thought we had a lot of churches down here. Listen, every curve you go around up there, you've got another church. Our church sign pointing to one. Here, churches everywhere. I, I said to myself, Lord, if we got so many, and most of them are Bible-believing churches, bible pre why aren't we having more of an influence in this world than we are with so many churches? thorny ground. They hear the word, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasures of life, and the lust of other things. What is it that has come up in your mind, in your heart, that has taken you away from your first love and loyalty to Jesus Christ? Choke the word. They go, maybe they even heard the admonition that we're, we're supposed to hear the truth and then we're supposed to go out and share it. But as they go out and share it, they can't do it effectively because their own life is compromised by the lust of their own flesh that they have compromised with the world. And their witness is totally ineffective and they become unfruitful. Ah, the good ground. The good ground heareth the word. Now listen to me carefully. This needs to be all of our attitude with an honest and good heart. I ask you to pray at the beginning. Lord, speak to my heart. Were you honest in that prayer? Lord, speak. To, I want you to speak to. All right, Lord, if you speak to my heart, if I hear you speaking to my heart, I will obey. That's what God's looking for. An honest and a good heart. And boy, his Holy Spirit helps us understand the truth. Isn't that amazing? You ever been reading your Bible and you just came to something, boy, all of a sudden the light bulb clicked on and, and, and you see some truth that you've never really gotten hold of before? You say, Holy Spirit, thank you for enlightening my mind and teaching me what you meant when you wrote it here. Thank God for that. And then bearing fruit. Did you know, listen, I'm not trying to leave it, relieve anybody's guilt this morning, uh, but uh, did you know God does not expect everybody to produce the same amount of fruit? He said some, Jesus speaking now, is he lying? He said some will bring, bring forth a hundredfold. Man, they'll have a full field of harvest. Some will have 60-fold. Maybe, maybe some will only get, how many of you understand, you never get 100% of everything you plant, right? Maybe you get 60%. Brother, I'll tell you, any preacher in the world would do cartwheels if he could have 60% of everybody he ever preached to that responded and began to obey the Lord and serve the Lord. He said some of you have 100-fold, some of you have 60-fold, some of you have 30-fold. Now, God does not expect us, listen to me, and I want you to help me here. God does not expect us all to have the same fruit, but God expects all of us to be faithful. Faithful. In fact, I, and I don't have time to go there, don't want you to even turn there, but in John chapter 15, in Jesus' parable of the vine, he, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He said, I have ordained that you go and bring forth fruit. Every Christian is to bring forth fruit. If you're not producing some fruit in your life as a Christian, you better run to the altar and beg God to change your life because I'm telling you, Jesus said in that passage, those that are not producing fruit, I prune them, I cut them off. He said, then I, I, I prune the vine so that it'll produce more fruit. Have you seen that progression in your life? You, you've gone from producing fruit to now more fruit. And then he says that you, he said, I keep working on you and, and keep helping you to grow and dealing with things that you're facing in life and in this world so that you can produce much fruit. 
Brother Jimmy, Miss Joanne, do you like it better when you have few eggs or a lot of eggs? Some of us in the church like it better when you have a lot of eggs. And you've been so gracious and kind because you have shared those eggs with many of us. Yeah, we want more fruit. We want much fruit. And then he said, I ha you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That is one of the most heartbreaking things to me as a pastor is people who come to church, they make a decision, they get on the altar, they start serving the Lord, and then they fall away. In fact, did not Jesus say in his writings to Peter, it would be better for you to never have come and known the truth than to have rejected the truth and trample the blood of Jesus under your unholy feet. There remaineth no more sacrifice for people who commit that sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. The parable of the sower. People need the Lord. Has, has the Holy Spirit spoken to anybody else here today? And me? Revival is a time for Christians to seek God with all of their heart and submit totally to the Lord. Revival is a time for Christians to repent of their sins and draw near to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Revival is a time for Jesus to be allowed to purge our lives so we can produce more fruit. I've said this to the Lord privately. I've said it before my wife. Sometimes it makes her look at me and says, are you that unhappy with me? Oh, just listen carefully. If God is through with me, if I can't see any more fruit on the trees in my life, I want him to take me to heaven. I don't want to stay here if God can't use me. I want to produce fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Hope this doesn't worry Brother Jonathan. He doesn't need anything else to worry him to make more of his hair fall out. But even at 70 years of age, I said, Lord, what do you have out there? I love my wife, my wife, and I love being at Wildwood. We love the work of God here. We love the people of God here. We love what God's doing, and I believe God's got greater things in store for us. But God can do that without me. I say, God, if you got something else out there where you can use me what time I have left to produce more fruit, just show me and lead me. And my wife says, no, I want to stay at Wildwood. She has graciously went wherever God has called us over these years. And she would do so again. But here's my point. I hate to start calling names because I'll leave out somebody that's so important and significant. But Brother Bobby, you're too young to have white hair, but I'm going to refer to some of these other white-headed folks that are, that are at least my age or older. Are you listening to me? God's not through with you. If he was through with you, you wouldn't be here. You might be in a casket here, but you wouldn't be here if he was through with you. So as long as you're here, may I say to all of you, may I say to you that are more senior than I am, may, may I say to the church leaders, we need you. I need you. Our families need you. There is no place for you to sit at home with your feet propped up on the recliner watching some garbage on television when you ought to be in God's house serving the Lord and faithfully representing the Lord that you serve. I need to say some things right here, Pastor. If you'll give me another couple minutes. 
and you're praying for revival, you're not going to have revival if you stay home. You see, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I've been at Wildwood for three years now. Sunday morning crowd, our biggest crowd. Sunday night crowd, he's down a little bit. Now, by experience, I hope this will be different, but by experience, Monday night is... Monday night's usually the lowest attended crowd we have in a, in a week of meetings. I don't know why that is. If people are worn out, they're just starting to work week, why should they be worn out already? Tuesday night, a little better. Wednesday night, about average. Will you hear me? Some of you dear folks are visiting. I know we don't expect you to be back every service, but listen to me. Are you a child of God? Come on, you can do better than that. Are you a child of God? Do you love the Lord? Do you love the work of this church? Do you want to see a revival come? Unless you're providentially hindered. I know some of you have jobs. I love Brother Carroll. He's my friend. Sometimes he has to work. They require him to work. Sometimes, sometimes you have a job. Sometimes in other areas you have a job. Not some choice you made, but you have a job that requires you to miss a particular service. But unless God puts something in your way where he providentially, where God puts something there that you can't avoid, you ought to be in every service between now and Wednesday night. Now, I don't have a perfect memory. No, I'm not even going to say that. God doesn't want me to say that, so I'm going to stop right there. Listen, we ought to be in God's house, and we ought to be praying. Are you doing that? I'm through now. But to those of you men who I personally came up to and said, I want to ask you, please be praying for me as I preach Sunday morning. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. But listen, I'm just a servant. I'm just one voice. Brother Hemet Patel is a powerful man of God. Are you praying for him? Are you going to be here to hear him? To support him? By the way, some of you, listen, the, the peril of the sore. Multitudes out there not saved. You ought to be working hard to bring some of your backslidden family members or unsaved loved ones and friends to come and hear this man of God preach so they'll have the opportunity to get right with God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Please, no one looking around. I want to talk to saved folks for a minute. We started out in the introduction talking about revival for saved folks. We ended up at the end talking about revival for saved folks. How many of you would say, Brother Phil, I'm being honest. I'm not pointing out, not going to tell Pastor, anybody else, just pray for me. God's speaking to my heart. Would you slip your hand up right now? All over this place. God bless you. I see it. Hands over here. Hands here. Hands here. Pray for me, Brother Phil. God's speaking to my heart. God bless you. God bless you.